Outward bound from the United Nations base at Sasebo, Japan, steams Her Majesty's New Zealand ship, Hawaii. It's the start of another war patrol by a ship which holds a proud record. She was the first of six Kiwi frigates to fire her guns in the Korean War. For the next 17 days, she'll be known only by her pennant number. Names look good, but give too much away. It's first degree of readiness as her guns are tested. This is the Navy way. Twice she steamed farther north than any other Allied warship. And did that make her stokers glow with pride? Asked Petty Officer Westby of Auckland. We get our first glimpse of Allied cooperation as the US minesweeper Dexterous maneuvers to come alongside. There's a reason for a hurry, for like all relieving ships of all nationalities, the Harwea carries the latest mailbags from the base. It's no easy job in a heaving sea to get a line on board, but it would take more than that to stop a blue jacket helping a comrade afloat. That's one of the laws of the sea. A simple bag made of post office canvas, but its contents mean much to the waiting crew. This is how it's been since five days after the outbreak of the Korean War. For, always remember, it was as early as that that New Zealand's Navy lined up alongside her allies. So to her station off the Korean coast, and to days and nights of ceaseless patrol. Mostly alone, but sometimes in company with another Allied ship. That's how to build team spirit among nations. First New Zealand officer to be commissioned from the lower deck, Commander G.R. Davis Goff, is the last war DSC. These are familiar waters to the captain of the Harwear. In three years, his squadron has patrolled nearly a quarter of a million miles. The radar aerial is a modern symbol of vigilance at sea, but quality in equipment would be useless without quality in men. Unending watchfulness, untiring care. That's the measure of a man's usefulness at sea. And it's on the efficiency of the radar watch that the ship depends for early warning of attack as she closes in to bombard enemy strong points ashore. position must be fixed to within very fine limits to ensure accuracy in these ship-to-shore bombardments. Incidentally, more than half the regular personnel of the New Zealand Navy have served in this campaign. On six tours of duty, their frigates have fired over 5,000 rounds from their four-inch guns. That these guns shall speak effectively in the United Nations cause is a responsibility indeed. Far from the fire of battle, other flames rage. 20,000 refugees are added to the homeless in Korea as fire obliterates a whole square mile of the crowded city of Busan. These were once homes in Seoul. Now they are silent reminders of aggression. It is the women folk who have to endure the full consequences of war. Though they may patch up some sort of shelter for their families, how can they build more than a semblance of home life against a background of four million homeless? The struggle for life would be hopeless, but for help sent in from the world outside. To nine street kitchens in Seoul, opened by United Nations Civil Assistance, the hungry come in their thousands each day. Upon a continuance of help, their whole future depends. 
Here they have tangible proof that the world is not blind to their needs. Needs which will continue long after the last shot is fired. Reconstruction gets going. Thousands of hutments are built, and small and ugly though they may be, they are better than the makeshift shanties they replace. Top priority is given to hospitals, and in particular to rehousing the children in these temporary wards which are maintained by Italy. Suffering from the after effects of exposure and malnutrition, the children are in need of kindness as well as medical care. Meet Steve Oxford and his cobber, Bob Hewson. Bob's at the business end of the gun there. Like craftsman Ted Paris, they all belong to 27th Field Engineer Regiment, LAD. When Ted gets letters, the post marks Cambridge. As for Bob, or Kai Kay, know that he'll see the job through. What interested Jack McCarthy of Samoa and engines is the same thing that got Barry Fruin of Invercargill mixed up in Brins. And like the rest of the crowd, They've got a job of maintenance to do. Gunners depend upon their work. This is how they get a 25-pounder back to its gun pit at Queen Battery. And don't forget, it's still in LAD hands until they're through. Eric Meacham unhooks. He comes from Gore, way down south. It's a down-to-earth job right enough in the LAD. Down-to-earth too, right it is. Yes, tough country this, especially when you've gun pits to build. No wonder they call a soldier a digger. That's a nice hillside section. And look, we even get American visitors on the levels lower down. Enough stuff comes over to make it well worth digging in, but it's really hard going. Wouldn't it rock you? It's another sort of breaking up day at this little batch. As down from Peter Battery walks Bombardier Ian McKinnon. You know, there's something about Ian that tells me he's going on leave. And leaves a sort of a dream to a man when he's been up here a fair while. Luckily, it comes more often than you'd think. They give him the gunner's farewell to remind him there's still a war on, but he didn't need reminding about his leave pass. And so to a parade with a difference at the street in Tokyo, known as the Ginza. And with Bombardier McKinnon as a cobber, Tom Henry of Timaru. Waiting for them now, well, uh, what do you call them? Geezers or geeses or something? No, they're two hand-picked house girls from Abzu Leave Camp. And they promised to show the boys round, in Japanese, mind you. The girls promised them local colour, and it's local colour they'll get. Ian will have a lot to write home to Invercargill about. They're learning about Japanese tradition as they approach the shrine, shrine I should say, of the Emperor Meiji, who brought Japan into the modern world. But I ask you, fancy being left standing on the pavement while the girls go upstairs to church. Yes, a picturesque old Japanese custom, which they might well adopt down south. From the shrine, the girls have brought lucky charms and the custom is to tie these on a wishing tree. And what happens next is anyone's guess. These Shinto ceremonies, by the way, are said to date back over 3,000 years. There'll be quite a collection of dates to remember by the time they get back. You see much of the new world in Tokyo, and much as old as the local line back home. Incidentally, Tom Fitzsimmons of New Plymouth has taken Ian's place for this part of the tour. To ride through a foreign country and see the conditions under which other men live, well, that's something a K-Force man can do every four months if he likes. 
And what's better, he does it at army expense. Back in Korea, there is no let-up. At Kimpo Airfield, meteors of the Royal Australian Air Force are got ready for close support operations over the Western Front. Fresh from an up-to-the-minute briefing come the pilots, with orders to patrol at low altitude over the British Commonwealth sector. This is ANZAC cooperation at its best. Every lull in the fighting is used to strengthen the hilltop positions. But meanwhile, careful watch is kept on enemy movement. A signal from Lieutenant Morris Munro and artillery support will be laid on. More signs of activity in the North Korean trenches have been observed. And from Hill 355, the word goes back. In the command post at Roger Battery, Lieutenant Jim Denby and Gunner Pete Stevenson of Geraldine await. Gunner Pat Williams of Hastings stands by to compute the range. And so, the call to action. From Southland, Canterbury and Bay of Plenty, these men have come. Gunners of the 16th New Zealand Field Regiment. A change of target is called for, and Sergeant Buckthorpe of Waihe shifts the trail. In a split second or two, Gunner Alan Costello will have lined up on the new bearing. And once more, the battery opens fire. the men of New Zealand play their part in this United Nations crusade. Here on the hilltops, they have taken their stand. Here they will stay until the war in Korea is no more.